Hello, hello. Today I want to give a little uh, presentation, and this is a presentation I'm hoping to give at the American Geophysical Union meeting next week in Washington, D.C., and this is a little bit of a test run, but the conference is obviously not public, so I thought I may as well use the test run to record it for YouTube. So this is about work I've been doing sort of in the in the background for quite some time, it's efforts for uh, that that's bringing several years of work together. And uh, now I feel ready to come out with it. It's on the silicic magnetism of the Katla caldera in South Iceland. Now, here in the background, we see Eyjafjallajökull, Yökul, and uh, this was the source of the 2010 eruption that locked down the air traffic in northern Europe. And uh, in the foreground here, we have Katla uh, caldera under the Myrdalsjökull glacier. So there is a much bigger system there under the glacier than the 2010 eruption, and it sits right next to it. So we ought to be a little concerned, I guess, because if Katla wakes up, we might have a little bit of a bigger problem at our hands. So let's uh, have a look here. And um, here we can quickly run all through the introduction material in the talk, and that is about central volcanoes versus fissure eruptions. Right now, we have an active fissure eruption in Iceland, and uh, these are often monogenetic, meaning there's a single event that may take a little bit of time, but it's a single event, while um, central volcanoes are polygenetic. They form over many thousands of years and they build up and Katla is one of those. It's a central volcano and Katla sits here in the rift zone and uh, it is the continuation of a whole string of volcanoes here and it continues actually out into the sea and there we have the Vestman Islands. So Katla is a large volcano. It's about uh, 1,380 um, meters tall and it's about 14 kilometers wide. It's very active. It uh, had about uh, um, 20 eruptions since recorded time in Iceland, which is about 900 in this case. And uh, there's uh, 180 recorded eruptions from Tefra that uh, were going on during the Holocene. The last major eruption was 1918, but there was smaller events in the 50s and in the late 90s, and they may have been subglacial eruptions. The uh, situation there is that we also have a number of silicic eruptions, and uh, these are usually quite small, but there was a big one 12,000 years ago, the Solheimer Ignimbride, which produced about seven cubic kilometers. Katla is also a big CO2 emitter, and uh, right now it's believed that it causes about 4% of the volcanic CO2 emissions. The plumbing system seems to be independent from um, Eyjafjallajökull, Yökul, but some people speculate the two are a little bit linked in some way, which might not be surprising. But good news, Katla did not actually wake up during the 2010 Eyjafjallajökull eruption. So uh, looking at this, what will I work about? I want to understand how the silicic magmas come, ag come about because they are often the more explosive ones. And here, two main models are out there, fractional crystallization in a closed system and partial melting of country rock. But the reality is often a little in between because there may also be processes like AFC assimilation and fractional crystallization. But let's have a look what we can actually find out. Now, I collected uh, rock samples, mainly from Lacasse, uh, who had a big study published in 2007, but also a number of tephras that go back to their work by uh, um, Bud. And this was a PhD thesis. And bringing these samples together, I had them analyzed for oxygen. This is Chris Harris's lab in South Africa. And there now we're presenting 57 whole rocks and five feldspar separate. So it's a large sample set to actually tackle that problem. Looking at the major elements, this is the Lacasse and Bot data. Um, here we are showing the basaltic suite and the felsic suite, the felsic ones in orange. And uh, there's a few background data, but there is not a lot of intermediate samples. We have only three, and while some of the tephra seem to fill that gap, there's uh, only a sporadic number of samples there. So we have a bimodal distribution. In terms of the rocks itself, we have sometimes duhedral crystals that have obviously, or seemingly grown in the magmas and the rocks they are residing in. But we also have crystal clots, meaning there's recycling of something that has been crystallizing. But we also have mafic enclaves, and uh, we have xenolith, partially melted xenolith. 
when we look at the other major elements, this pattern is maintained. We have a bimodal distribution. The intermediate ones, they don't even span the entire range. We have the cattle basaltic suite in blue, the intermediates in green, the silicics in orange, and the felsic senilis that we have analyzed there in pink. Now, when we look at the trace elements here, we see that the felsic ones relative to the mafic ones in blue, they have a pronounced strontium and a little bit of a europium anomaly, and that is usually linked to plagioclase growth. So fractionation did occur, but was this the sole process? Well, we're not entirely sure because uh, here, when we look at this diagram, this is now the oxygen data, we'll see rather swiftly that the basaltic rocks plot here, there's one exception, or it's actually two samples that are an exception, and uh, they are actually very high in LOI, so these are altered samples, it's these two chaps here. So I think we can ignore them uh, for the petrogenetic consideration. And here we have the basaltic suite, here the intermediates, and the felsic ones go to much, much lower values, well below mantle, that's the gray bar here. And uh, here we have the felsic xenolith, and they are really low, and that implies they have been hydrothermally altered at pretty high temperatures. And it looks almost as if we want to use that uh, as a contaminant for that. Let's explore that idea further. Here we plot delta 80 no versus silica, and this is just a schematic diagram. And there indeed, it looks like that the fractional crystallization line, the Rayleigh fractionation is not followed. Only two samples plot here. Most of them seem to go down here at some point, And down here, we have these xenolith. So this is very, very useful. Now, if we look at the uh, source variations, there is a bit of a ne neodymium variation, but um, there seems to be also differentiation going towards the low delta 18O range. So let's not forget there could be some mantle source variation over the lifetime of the volcano, but all of the silicic magmas that result from any differentiation process seem to go towards low delta 18O. We modeled this with the magma chamber simulator package. This goes back to uh, Spera and Borson. And you see my colleague, who is a co-author, he has been working intensely with uh, these individuals. And uh, here we have a model. There's a fractal model. That's the dark lines, or the dark little diamonds. And then we have various stoping models where we are adding material to the magma in different stages. So initially, it was difficult for the software to calculate low delta 18 o minus ones were not possible, but that has now been fixed. The next version to come out will be able to do that. But we got a kind of a pilot version, and uh, thanks to UC, we were able to model this, although the current version can't fully do it. So here we have the FC line from Basalt to the uh, most evolved felsic ones up here. So they can be explained by cross system fractionation, but that's only two samples. Most of them require some form of assimilation. And the model here simulates assimilation of this material, 5% assimilation, 15% and 25. And for the most extreme samples, we will be close to the 25 by the looks of it. This is for major elements, but it holds true for trace elements as well. In fact, it's surprising because it seems that the contaminant must have had the very same trace element composition as the magma. And that makes it very plausible that we are contaminating the magma with products that the volcano had stored inside from a previous episode, for example. And the longer these silicic rocks rest there, the more they get in contact with fluids, get altered. And then we see big changes for the delta 18 O and uh, we see very little changes on the trace elements and major elements. So the contaminant is very sim uh, similar, but the oxygen is different. This brings me to this little model here. This is a seismic tomography onto which we are projecting this. There seems to be uh, a deeper reservoir and a more shallow reservoir system. And the basaltic suite is most likely mainly hosted in the deep one, but then it's erupting from there. And then in the shallow system, this is where the felsic rocks would reside. And that's where they get in contact with these hydrothermally altered rocks in the top few kilometers. And this is consistent with some preliminary barometry in uh, Bott's thesis. And uh, there we could potentially do more work, but the tomography is actually very clear that we have an anomaly here. So that's 
where the felsic magmas would sit, and that's where the contamination is happening. And in conclusion, 95% of the analyzed silicic volcanics show the low delta ADNO signal at Katla, they're below mantle, and uh, the basalts align with uh, MORP, 5.5 to 5.7 is MORP, and that means we don't have an anomalous, uh, anomalously low mantle. We have, however, a contaminant that is added while the magma is traveling through the volcano. So we have deep storage, basaltic, mantle-like magmas come in, and there is a whiff of contamination maybe in the lower crust, but eventually when the material rises up, we have assimilation, and this could either be in form of assimilation and fractional crystallization, or even in the form of binary mixing. That was the yellow triangles that were shown in the modeling plot. And uh, here we're pretty sure assimilation is the main driver for bringing these signals, the oxygen signals down. And uh, we are not entirely sure whether it's AFC or BM or a combination of both. And if you have watched this recent Netflix kind of horror uh, movie or horror sequel on Katla, which um, basically has people that have died a while ago uh, waking up once the volcano is erupting, well, maybe if the volcano is erupting, we'll get more answers. But uh, I'm not entirely sure. Some questions may remain. And, uh, well, they keep us entertained uh, as this Katla Netflix adaptation. So I like to thank you, and if there is time for questions, they are of course very, very welcome. And I'll stop sharing here. And uh, thanks, Emil. I hope you found this interesting. And we are finishing the manuscript now, so we're hoping to submit this as an article, as an essay to a journal early next year. Thank you very much, and all the very best. <laughs>